Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Marc Andre Pigeon. I'm the director of the Canadian Centre for the Study of Cooperatives. And uh, hearty welcome to our annual lecture in honor of the late and, and sincerely great Ian McPherson. Um, and it's also the second of our lectures like this to be held virtually. So uh, we're, we're carrying on. <laughs> um, before we begin today's conversation, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, for those of us here in Saskatoon, I think it's important we acknowledge that we are settlers on Treaty 6 territory, home of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, Nakota Sioux, and the Métis. We're grateful for this land and the water and the skies and this tree's original inhabitants. May we be good neighbors to one another, good stewards of this land, and good ancestors to all our children. Before I introduce our lecturer and our speaker, uh, a few comments on how we're going to move through this presentation today. Um, to help the, thing, the event run smoothly. I'm gonna ask everyone to stay muted and turn off your video. I'll keep mine on so, so Carol has someone to look at while she's talking. Um, so, but then you can feel free to turn your videos back on when we get to the question and answer portion of the event. So here's how things are gonna play out. We're gonna have Carol speak for about 30, 35 minutes thereabouts. Um, we'll open it up for questions afterwards. If during the presentation you have questions that you wanna kind of put on the table, please use the chat function. And I'll take note of them and I'll ask Carol those questions after she's done her talk. Um, in the Q&A portion, you can also use the raise hand function in reactions and I'll call on you um, to ask your question. If you have any logistical questions today, um, please reach out to Stan Yu via the chat function and he'll be happy to help you. Lastly, I guess, and you put a, would have seen this already, but this event's gonna be recorded um, and then published on our YouTube channel. If you prefer not to be included in the recording, you can turn off your camera, as we've just asked you to do, uh, and change your, your name on Zoom to remain anonymous. Now, with these formalities out of the way, a few words about our lecture uh, in honor of Ian McPherson before I introduce Dr. Carol Henry. So, um, as I said in years past, I haven't had the pleasure, I didn't have the pleasure of knowing Ian McPherson personally, uh, but I do know he was deeply interested in seeing that the cooperative model spread to places far and wide, and he believed in its power to to change people's lives. Um, just to give an illustration of, of that commitment, um, he served as chair of the Canadian Cooperative Association, uh, CCA, which is now Cooperatives and Mutuals Canada, or CMC. Now, at the time, when, when he was chair of CCA, um, that organization had an international cooperative development arm called the Cooperative Development Foundation, or CDF. Now, CDF today is a standalone charitable entity that hosts a scholarship in Ian McPherson's name. Uh, Ian was also instrumental, and I'll just bring this up again in the international context, uh, in the work to add a seventh cooperative principle, care for community, uh, for communities, uh, to the International Cooperative Association's lists of cooperative principles. So I think it's kind of fitting then that our, our speaker today is someone who embodies Ian's care for communities, his work uh, that tied kind of pragmatic engagement with academic research, and his ambition to see cooperatives prosper uh, the world over and empower people in their communities. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Carol Henry. Um, she is a recognized international scholar practitioner in community engaged research, international development. And sorry, I just lost my script here. And, uh, at, and development projects at home and abroad, including but not limited to Africa, the Caribbean and Southeast Asia. Uh, her research interests include school and community health, child nutrition, children and consumers literacy and health, food security and food system. Um, so it's important to note, I think that while Carol doesn't describe herself as a co-op researcher specialist, her work, particularly in Ethiopia, has involved helping women establish cooperatives to better feed themselves, their families and communities. And I'm also hopeful that uh, Carol may be in the near future partnering with the Cooperative Development Foundation around um, some of her very important work. Uh, so with that, I'd like to, uh, have everyone welcome Carol to our event and uh, ask Carol to take over the conversation. Carol, over to you. Perfect. Thanks, Mark. Um, it's great to be here in honor of Ian McPherson, and it's great to see the number of in the audience. Some their names and can't see the faces, but at least familiar in names. Thank you. Um, Stan, are you ready? Stan is going to share my PowerPoint for me. And we are going to, for the next 30, 35 minutes, talk about one of the partnerships 
that we've here at the University of Saskatchewan has had with Ethiopia and share some of the key innovations as well as why this partnership was so successful and was so important for the university. You'll notice on the left side, it talks about pulse. Pulse is good for you, it's good for the planet, and it's also good for the farmers. And if you haven't included them in your diet, you should. Can you go to the next slide, please? So what I'd like to talk about, a little bit about the context of why Ethiopia, and then share some of the, what we call the SIFSERVE, which is the Canadian Food, Serv Food Service International Research Fund, which was a blend of IDRC and Global Affairs Canada, and with the partnership between the, UNA, the U of S and Hawassa University. Talk about some of the components, um, moving on to scaling up, and then what were some of the driving forces that kept us going. Next. So we like to think of this project as a 20 year project. And in a sense, the project began in 1997, two soil scientists at a conference, one from Hawassa University, one from the Department of Soil Science College of Agriculture here in campus, talked about the need to improve soil fertility in Ethiopia. And with that, we, they started on a journey which included capacity building institution and otherwise. And in 2018, we celebrated 20 years and we celebrated it recognizing that it really did take a village to build, to, to really support the child. Because while the focus was on women and children, we had a multidisciplinary partnership, which includes academics on both sides, research organizations, private industry, the really heavy involvement of the government here in Canada through funding, and also through mentorship and in, and in several ways. And then of course, our young people, children and women. And so I'll talk about a number of the innovations as we go forward. The next slide talks about hunger. And I noticed one quick um, question in the chat about food insecurity, the current war in Ethiopia, and is that one of the consequences? But most of us, for example, we think about hunger. We talk about, oh, I need to eat, I haven't eaten all day, I'm hungry. What does that look like though to someone in Ethiopia, for example, in 2008 when I went to Ethiopia and I saw children on the street who had no, no they were just going, they were going, no smile, nothing. And when you talk to others, you found that perhaps two days, three days, they hadn't eaten and they didn't know where the next meal was coming from. And such is the cause for one, two, in nine people worldwide who are hungry and undernourished, meaning that they lack the necessary nutrients then from a quality diet to keep them safe, to keep them well. Next slide. This is a slide I won't spend any, a lot of time on, if any, but just to show you the context of hunger and how widespread it is. And while um, Ethiopia is not on this list, we know that in Sub-Sahara, Africa, um, hunger is a major, major concern. So, when we talk about hunger today, the Global Nutrition Report of 2020 suggests that we are seeing a decline in some areas of the world, but it's not moving fast enough. 
And a lot of that, some of the consequences are that Northern um, governments um, are beginning to pull away and not necessarily because they want to, need to, but that pull then is creating other problems for food insecurity in some of these Southern countries. The other problem with in Southern countries, not only are they not seeing the development that, that, um, dollars, but the, the climate change, droughts, major wars in Ethiopia right now, there's a major conflict. And if you are, have read any of the papers, you realize that this major civil war is creating um, malnourished children, women and children. It's creating food insecure household. And we are not just not sure how far that is going to go. Next slide. So when we look at Ethiopia, this is particularly troubling because in Ethiopia, the principal source of revenue is, is um, agriculture. And that means that the majority of the farmers are subsistent farmers, meaning that in most cases, they, they just make enough to support their household in part because land is scarce, they don't own the land and a family of seven may live a half an, an hectare of land. Difficult to have a house to keep that and also to raise animals as well as to have a garden. So a number of these situations are creating problems, not only in Ethiopia, in sub-Saharan African countries and elsewhere. Canada is not immune. We do have food insecure households in Canada and that we see each year, at least one in seven children are go to bed hungry. So we're not immune, but we sometimes tend to forget that as a developing country. We talk about the hidden hunger, which is a major public health concern in most developing country. And simple means that you, a child may have a full belly, they may have a bowl of um, cereal, but they don't have the necessary nutrient, minerals and vitamins to keep them safe. Next. So one of the, in most of the literature now, we're seeing that growing call to look back at diversifying the agri-food system, that the monocultures doesn't work, that we need strong agricultural system and integrated with nutrition, we might be able to make a difference. And so that was what this 20 year project was about. And so I will share with you now some of the information from that project. Okay, so this is Ethiopia. Its traditional um, diet is grain. Grain is the main mainstay. If you've been to Ethiopia, you've had the second one down, which is Algeria, which is teff. And on it, you will notice that there are pockets of food, some vegetables, some meat, and so forth. And that might be the meal for several people for one day. But anyway, it, the major thing here is that it is a grain, grain is the major stay, cereal grains. And so there was a great need then for introducing pulse. So the U of S, along with, as I said, the CIFSER Fund, IDRC, and Global Affairs Canada, sought to address hunger, poverty, undernutrition, whatever you may consider it within an agricultural lens. And we like to think about that from farm to finger. I always said from farm to fork, but then one of our Ethiopian colleagues said to finger, because that Nigeria that you saw there, you eat with your hands. So it's to finger that we're talking about. And we did so, but with higher yielding 
and nutrient-dense chickpeas and other beans, particularly haricot beans. Why pulse? We said, of course, that they're a great health benefit, not just to the developing country, but you see here in Canada, in North America, there's a shift, there's a move towards plant-based protein because of the major health benefits as it relates to chronic diseases, um, diabetes, obesity, and so forth, as it relates to addressing issues of hunger. Because you see, pulse is cheap. And so while in some of these developing countries, it might be very expensive to purchase meat, you can't to purchase pulse. It also is good for the environment because of its nitrogen fixing properties. And from a farmer's perspective, it's an adaptable low starch maintenance crop. And very importantly, in most of the um, areas where we have been in Ethiopia, where pulse wasn't grown before, what farmers bought into is that it could be a second crop, meaning you could grow your wheat and once you have reap those, you can go pulse. And so farmers were more than willing to try it because they could do double cropping. And then of course, it, one of the great role we'll talk about is the women's role and how that empowered them and also increase their own um, economic well-being. So, when we look at the, the um, study, of course, from 1997, the early portions of that was about capacity building and soil fertility. In 2008, though, we started um, Global Affairs had what we call call one, call three, call five. Some people might remember that. And in the early studies, which we call baseline studies, what we wanted to look at from a nutrition point of view is ways that we could improve nutrition, look at what the health benefits of the households were and how, what the health benefits of pulse were and how we could improve nutrition, particularly of young children and female using this whole food strategy. And this meant then that we wanted to build the full potential of agriculture. So the soil scientists, the plant scientists, agronomists, we looked at the food processing, consumer, along the value chain to marketing, commercialization. It was a complex project. These are some of the early studies that looked at land preparation because we talked about soil and what they were doing here is to look at, and I won't, I have to admit, I'm not a soil scientist, hold those questions, but just simply to say to you that alongside the nutrition was a great focus on the production productivity side. And so um, looking at different management strategies, soil management, plant, seed was also very important. These were early studies that looked at pulse. One of the things why I kept this in is because I wanted to show that even in our early studies, we found that some of the practices like fermentation and so forth that had stopped um, doing the dirge system or the major wars in Ethiopia and Eritrea, they had come back and now some of the older women were teaching these during our time to the younger women so that they were able to do household processing and that was good. We did acceptability studies, product development for complementary food, and a lot of that was looking at how you could wean the children from the breast and make sure that they had healthy snacks, um, healthy foods to eat. This one was one of the studies that was done here 
at the University of Saskatchewan. So what we did is not only were we, we participating in the field studies in Ethiopia, we brought young scientists, we brought PhD students, we brought senior scientists to the University of Saskatchewan. A majority of them were in the College of Agriculture where they could learn some new techniques so that they could bring those back to Ethiopia so that it would be a win-win for everyone. And so these were looking at sensory properties of porridge, and this was to feed complementary food. Then once we had in, in um, 2015, then we were asked to scale up Pulse Innovation. And this was, we were asked to incorporate some of the lessons that we had learned from the pilot studies, from agriculture, and also from nutrition. And here we were now focusing a lot on women farmers, that we did the business cases, marketing, and value chain. We also looked at the social aspect, which was the adoption, how did that work within those communities? One, the goal of course was improving foods and nutrition security for livelihood. The, what you're seeing here is one of our master's um, students in Ethiopia who did a study that looked at feeding young children. What, what it was was a combination of cereal grain and pulse, har white haricot bean, an egg, a local vegetable, and this is what the young child was eating. And something that's very interesting in doing this work was that we use local utensils. So the mothers brought their own um, utensil from home. And if they didn't, we found other ways to use local utensils, local presenters, so that then once they got back home, it wasn't so difficult for them to follow what, we, what they had learned. So looking at the approaches, our target was 70,000 Ethiopian farmers. We looked, for example, at the adoption of suitable varieties, short, dura short duration, high yielding, resistant, resistant, and also drug a drought resistant. This was important. While we were there, they had the 10 year drought and you only had to drive to the field you notice that just one more week, if they had rain, things would be great. So we had to look at ways to, ways to ensure that you had enriched seeds that grew quickly, that were resistance resistant, and that could manage even in times of drought. And so notice the second line talked about the agronomic packages and if a lot of that had to do with the type of fertilizer that was encouraged, weeding, different pra management practice, that if those were followed, then we were, we, those farmers that followed them saw good results. And along with that, we had nutrition education. I would say though, one of the strengths of the nutrition education was the involvement or the partnering with government. And so the, Bu the Bureau of Health, the Regional Ministry of Health partnered with us so that the health extension workers were able to work along with us who did the training. These were women from the same villages. And so they were able not only to train, but to monitor, to see that things were doing well. We had farm radio, International, which is a Canadian international NGO who helped us quite well and in, in really communicating the message broadly. One of the, the big things though, the challenges you saw was transportation or linking farmers to market. And I think this is where the cooperatives came in because true by linking farmers to different cooperatives, they were able to pull together 
so that they were able to get their gains to market. And finally, of course, gender was into, in, just woven into all the interventions. So if we were to look at the strategies, we had improved pro pulse productivity. And you notice um, we talked, they had the best strain of rhizobian agronomic practices we talked about, and we also talked about nutrition. So we worked alongside each other. And that was also very practical because these, this, these um, districts were far. You couldn't really do, you had to go together as a team and it made great sense to work alongside together. And, and I, I won't go through the full pathway, but just to say as complex as it looked, we, we, we made it through each one of those sections. This I want to show you, and I thought if you look on this side, um, the, not the side with just the, the, um, the green side, but we're, that was a farmer's field that you're looking at. And if you look closely, the ambassador, Canadian ambassador to Ethiopia was with us in the field, um, came to the farmer's training, offered support. And this was one of another thing that we found that was very helpful is the support we received from our Canadian par partners as well as our local partners. This is just showing you chickpeas variety once it has been fertilized and how green it is compared to um, the drought looking soil that we would see in most places. And these are just evidence from the field. These are young women, old women who have talked about how they have benefited from um, growing chickpeas. It has helped to use my limited land efficiently. And that was the concept of double cropping, which meant that she could grow chickpeas after she has had grown her main crop. The lady at the bottom, was a head of household, many children, and she was able to do well as well. This was the first time she was growing chickpeas. Women were, we considered agents of change. When we started to think about it, um, everyone asked, well, just how you're going to do this because women are not known for agriculture in, in Ethiopia at that time. And we thought, oh good, they will serve in nutrition, in processing, but by working with what we call cluster, using clustering, where five or more, most time, five farmers would come together. And in that cluster, you would have one female or two females. And by doing that, they were able to provide a peer learning as you would see in the impact. They were also able to help one another. So they brought synergy to coordination and they improved learning, then meant that they had greater bargaining power. And also they, they were able to utilize some of the, the extension services. Notice that in the output at, towards the end of the program, we had about a hundred, close to 200 cluster, having five farmers per cluster. We had farmers that were considered seed farmers. Um, some grew two kilograms of seed. Others who were doing it for commercial purposes grew about 20 kilogram. But in all those clusters then, were able to help the women to do well. This is just a short to look at nutrition education. We, when we <clears throat> talked about nutrition education, we didn't do a lot with the babies. What we did was to educate the mothers and in some cases the fathers 
and in some cases the adolescent. And through those nutrition education, then the, that improvement in knowledge, attitude, and practice, so that the incorporating of pulse into complementary feed meant that this was the mean weight gain for young children. So as one mother said, by doing that, she said she could see the difference or the village could see the difference that the children had better face. They were rounded and not so gaunt. And so those then became, I would say, um, agents who helped to convert the, the different communities so that they became a part of the program. The other thing that we did, so women participated in the clustering. We had also business models where young women um, were trained then and they were also organized and they were all, um, to coach, but also to prepare their own, prepare food. And so we have what's called micro franchising business. We had um, Guts Agro Industry, a private industry that did food processing, that sold snacks and other things. And that industry then, women worked with them and were able to sell to the communities. Most of that happened in the peri-urban areas. Um, difficult to do that a lot in the very rural areas because when you, when you box things, most people see that as additional costs. But it was a great way then for women, not only to make money, but also to improve their, the nutritional status of their families. Women had other enterprises. If you look, there were markets. So there were farmers market. They were able to sell, they were able to, to sell in those places, right? And one of the things we found why that was important is that while the men did farming, not all men got money back to take care of the household. So helping the mothers to, to develop their skills, literacy skills, food preparation, farming, was a great way to make sure that the household was fed, that these children went to school, and so on and so forth. So it really, really increased household income, increased purchasing power, and also it empowered the women so that they were able to help the entire families. And as we say, one of the success story was partnering with the government, Bureau of Women, Children and Youth, who help us to um, implement several of the cooperative union, the, the Bureau, Regional Bureau of Agriculture took the learning and they also partnered with us. So the, the cooperatives are still going when at 2018, when CIFSERV funds were finished, both University of U of S and Hawassa University on a smaller scale said we wanted to see this continue. And what we did then was to continue to develop those cooperatives for women. This is an interesting story. Um, one, of, one of the trips to Ethiopia, uh, I was there, I was listening to one of the presentations about complementary food. The women said, you know, we've got, we understand what you're telling us. We've got the teaching, we don't have the food. And so I asked them that if we were to give them the haricot beans, would they plant it? They all clapped. And so I went back to Hawassa University told the researchers, and in the end, 368 women were given two kilogram of hard cut beans to plant. The researchers from Hawassa University saw to it that this happened and did the training. Six months when I went back, one woman was smiling because out of her two kilogram, she had reaped 50 kgs of hard cut beans. 
And one of the interesting things is when you spoke to her about it and you asked, how is that impacting the family? She said before, when her husband planted, he gave them what he could, but he sold most of it. Now she said, we're equal partners. We make decisions of what to keep, what to sell and what to grow. And so the, the power improvement, empowering the women, empowering their decision-making within the household was one of the strongest lessons that we learned. And this then just talks about the impact by gender and notice how well that the female did at the end of the day when it came to, to um, more than 50,000 farmers have got direct access to improved varieties of chickpeas, but more so that these included about 44% of, of women farmers. Next. And I, before ending that, I must say one more, that one of the strength of this program was capacity building. It didn't keep the slide in that talks about the farmer's field, the farmer's school, the model farmers where um, we would bus farmers to go to see a, one of the farm field, the demonstration plots, so that they too, because we know that people learn by observing. And so that was capacity building for the farmers. There was also capacity building for the different local institution that worked along with us. And so it became a real partnership going forward. And as you see at the bottom, the slide, those were children, young people in the masters in applied nutrition, the majority of whom are working in government offices, academia, a few have come to the U of S, have done their PhD, some have gone back to Hawassa, others are still here, but it was a great experience, not only to teach them how to fish, but to teach them a way that they could do it for the long term. So I, I thought that we also, it was great that we had the partnership. They worked extremely well, took a while to build, but we worked together. But there were some driving poor forces and I would be remiss if we didn't talk about government policies in, the, in Ethiopia that also made it possible. Government policies in um, internationally, the SDGs, um, to our advantage, the rise in price in animal source protein meant an increased demand for pulse. And then we looked at a number of, the, of industries and other things that were happening, not to mention the two, 2016 International Year of Pulse. So there were a number of policies that really helped to drive the increase on the work that we did. There were also challenges and I will hold on and I will tell you those at the um, after we've completed the presentation. Okay, and so just want to say thank you for listening and also to acknowledge that it was the funding, the long-term funding from the government of Canada that made this possible through various iterations from 1997 until 2018. They believed in the project in its many, many phases and they funded. And um, so women and children and Ethiopian farmers were better for that. It was also the partners and the research centers and everyone who contribute. So thank you. Thank you so much, Carol. Uh, that was wonderful and so, so interesting. Um, so many questions in my mind, uh, but we have one in the chat that I'm going to um, throw your way. It's from Abdel. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, Abdel. Uh, but your, your, the question from Abdel is, um, is it ethical to end the hunger issues in Ethiopia and start a huge hunger problem in a big country of more than 100 million in Egypt? And I think 
Adele is referring to a dam. Um, that, uh, uh, yes. So I wonder okay, if you have any so, reflections on that, Carol. <laughs> I'm sorry. I am not touching that one. <laughs> <laughs> I have my personal thoughts, but I'm going to hold on to that. Fair enough. Um, so, Carol, maybe I'll throw one out while we're waiting for more questions to pop up in chat, or please use your hand raise um, to signal my, get my attention, and I'll call on you. Um, so this sounds like a really powerful model of development, right, for, for women um, and for the communities. How, do you have a sense of how widespread um, this approach is in other parts of the world? Like, is this something that, let's say, global affairs and others have taken seriously and they see the opportunity to expand this model or I, is this a one-off? No, I think so. I think why this worked over 20 years was because IDRC and Global Affairs really believed in it. They saw that this model work, it was really mobilizing the community to help themselves. We saw in, we normally on our visit to Ethiopia, would go to different fields, different areas. And it was so interesting to see some of the communities who had heard the Farm Radio International's presentation that they were using the material and the information that they had learned. I think often we go into communities, we tell them what to do, but learning from the farmers, learning from the local practitioners. So, I tend to call it a north, south, south. And south, south meant that even though Hawassa University was our local partner, this, it meant that there were several other organization that was working alongside Hawassa University, other universities, research organizations, NGO. And we couldn't do it on our own. We were going there once or twice a year. It took that collective, um, the government, the regional Bureau of Agriculture to say, we want in your value and our voices. And so we want to be part of that decision. And I think this is why that has worked so well. And just recently, Global Affairs asked, this is a model we would like to expand. How, how interested are you? All right. It's a nice question to have asked of you, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just looking around to see if there are any other questions, because um, I've got a, a whole stack of them, but I want to make sure other people have a chance uh, to ask something here. Oh, and there's a question uh, from Isabel. So I'll ask that one, uh, Carol. It says, it sounds of, as if relationship building was important in the 20 year process. Can you say a bit more about your own time commitment to field work and managing? <sighs> It was it, it. It took a long. It took a lot of time. Um, we considered that a complex project. So I can tell you that 2008, when I got to Ethiopia, Hawassa University's College of Agriculture is well developed, and soil scientists were going. But we knew that that was not enough. IDRC said we need to look for the others. And so when we had the um, one example was when we had the, what we call the inception workshop and different researchers from the university and elsewhere came and I would go to my, my um, colleague, Dr. Shalani and says, why are we not including this one? And why are we not including that one? And so I spent a lot of time looking for the social scientists, the economists, the, the other um, scientists that we felt had a role to play. And so that was it. We also had to think about the students because one of the things you wanted to leave was to make sure that you left a young scientist who would carry. The relationship building, I think, took a long time. One of the blessings with relationship building is that there was a good platform to build on, but we're now building in other communities and we're finding that even though we can't visit the community, we have to do a lot of dialogues because it's so important for the communities to feel that they own this information, 
their voice is valued and you want to take time to listen to them. So yeah, it was, it took a long time, but it was very, very worthwhile. That's great, Carol. So uh, the, Murray has a question here that I've been burning to ask. I, I kept in reserve, but I'll ask it from Murray's perspective. Can you say a bit more about what you saw cooperatives doing and, and what needs to be done next? So the cooperatives that we saw in, in well, that we started in Ethiopia in a way, I will tell you, Murray, that one of the things we wish we had at the time when we got into it is a lot more money to do microfinancing of these, to help them. And a lot of the finance that we had was already spent, but people were willing to work together and the government was able to assist us. So we would go to the government, local government, say, this is what we wanted to do. And they say, this is what we can afford to do. We would allow you the space, the equipment. And so they, that was how partnering went for us. And we were able to work together. In another setting, I think we would like to set money aside to make this a priority because we saw how well it worked, even on a small scale. Carol, I might ask a follow-up question on Murray's. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, Ethiopian government, uh, one of the ministries there was instrumental. I think I understood you saying this. It was instrumental in the yeah. cooperative component of that. Yeah. Um, is there, do you get a sense that there's a there's an appetite for cooperatives in Ethiopia in general? And I asked that question because there's a fantastic study about forestry cooperatives in Ethiopia. And I, I just, I'm seeing a bit of a pattern, very small pattern, sample of two. But uh, is there some evidence that that's a model they look to on, on a kind of regular basis for? I think so. You know, when, when we first, when I went to Ethiopia, 2008, you saw farmers that were tilling the soil. You saw farmers, everything they did was with the hoe and the tractor, right? 2016, you saw big um, commercial farming starting and farmers realized at that time that the only way they were going to survive is to come together. So you had those federal peasant um, associations, you had the farmers associations, and I think it wasn't difficult, uh, but because of that, to performers to understand that if they didn't group, they would they would they would lose out because you can't compete with the big um, tractors that were coming in from so many places. Once the roads were got better, a lot happened. I think there's an appetite for cooperatives. And I know particular for women, that worked really well. We have a, a, another question here from Tian, uh, who's in their ag economics program, uh, PhD student, also works for CDF. So I'll ask this uh, verbatim. What is the scale of pulse production compared to traditional grain production? Do farmers adopt pulses as an add-on or are they interested in growing more for more profit? Do they harvest for self-consumption or do they grow in a kind of market-oriented way? Like so tests, it, it, I know that chickpeas and mung bean, Ethiopia is one of it's one of the large export to the Middle East, particular mm -hmm. chickpeas. Haricot beans is gaining um, strength as well. In some areas, though, when we went in very new, farmers were very reluctant to go pulse because they're saying, one, haircut beans, they said, we don't eat it. We don't know what to do with it. We don't eat it. So they were very reluctant to do so. But once they found this concept of double cropping, which we did, that you're not going to lose because even if you grow it and the rains didn't come, well, you had already reaped reap your wheat, so you should be okay. So I think that concept, begun to catch on in the, in the um, and the regional Bureau of Agriculture in the Southern Ethiopia really supported that from that position. Great. So we saw the government looking at increasing protein by going with maize and high protein maize, but still pulse still captures most of the land um, because also, you know, pulse haircut bean goes in 90 days. And so we're, and because we had 
high yielding foods. Mightly, mightly, one of the things we were told by uh, some of the female farmers is that the high yielding one cooked faster, but it wasn't as tasty as the old one. So somehow we might need, you know, we've lost some of those nice um, from the old one. But yeah, now there is a scale, there is a need. And I think this is why Global Affairs is interested in seeing it further. Yeah, it's great. Uh, you know, something you said just a minute ago, Carol, was that um, the farmers had some, particularly the kind of more peasant farmers had a lot of incentive to come together because you were seeing this growing industrialization of farming. Yes. Is that something that's happening? You know, where's that coming from, I guess? Is that, who's, who's behind that growing scale and is it happening generally? You know, the one of the things in that happened is when the Chinese when China came in and the Chinese came uh -huh. in, they started to develop the roads. So you that was the worst, the biggest problem for Ethiopia. Ethiopia, unlike most of the African countries, boasts that they weren't colonized, meaning you know the British was there. It also meant, though, that the highways and some of the roads they didn't have. So in the 2000, when the Chinese came in, they started to build these roads. So it, my trip from Addis Ababa to Hawassa used to take five hours. Now that was cut to two and a half by car, but half an hour by Ethiopian Airlines. And as those happened, then it attracted commercial commercialization. Gotcha. Okay. Very interesting. Um, you know, if I don't see any other questions, I'm going to keep asking, but I, I do want to give people a chance. Um, any have any questions? Feel free to raise your hand, throw it into chat. I'm, I'm very interested, Carol, in the, the gender dimension of this work. Um, it's been a major theme of the Cooperative Development Foundation. I know it is for global affairs as well. Um, what what would you how would you describe the culture in Ethiopia? I, I don't know anything about their culture. Uh, and would it, was it a patriarchal culture, a more egalitarian culture? And, yeah. and what kind of challenges did it did you find running running up against when you were trying to empower? Ethiopia, them? Ethiopia is very patriarchal. When we first talked, it was I still remember um, our global affairs IDRC specialists when they came and they would say, how are you implementing gender into the project? And my, my, my Ethiopian colleague would say, well, we have given 12 scholarships to female students. And my Canadian colleague would get very frustrated and says, that is not gender integration. Let's talk about what you are going to do. So that's when in the scaling up, we, we had to look, we had to promise that we would have at least 25% of women in agriculture. And we thought, how is that going to happen? Because most women are, are in the household. They don't do agriculture unless they're weeding. The men plant, the women weed. But by a lot of training and education, we had meetings, um, I would say engagements where we had the men in one side, we talked to them about the importance of gender integrating, integration, we talked to the women, and then we brought them together. And as they shared, some of the men thought, ah, we didn't see it that way. I remember one that I was, and the, the men were saying, oh, no, 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 this is not true. And then one of the older women said, let me tell you, and all the men start laughing. And so they realized then that if they, this was going to survive, that the women needed to have a voice. And so I, I think slowly we broke some of those barriers, and, but it is a patriarchal country. Thank you. And Carol, there's a kind of uh, follow on question from Mackie here. Um, Mackie's asking, uh, you highlighted that the co-op model is helping improve women's bargaining power. Do you see any evidence of a change in the way the roles are distributed? And I think you kind of addressed this a little bit, but within the households, are there tasks more evenly divided, for example, or are there other tangible signs of? Um, 
it's more balanced. It, 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 you know, in it, it's interesting. I will give you one example in our class of 30 students in the graduate class, the most of them were men. And when we talked about men going to the market to shop, the men said, it's not just that they couldn't. The women themselves at the market said, that's not your place. So it, it wasn't just the men who didn't want to do it. It was also the women, it was a cultural thing. Mm -hmm. And so to break those barriers will take time. Right. Carol, I might, um, I have one last question. I know you've got to run and there's a snow impediment here. Um, Murray says, thank you. And he has to run by the way, uh, but thank you for a great talk. Uh, this question I'm going to ask might have been of great interest to Murray. Uh, we had a student here from Ethiopia a couple of years ago, a wonderful academic scholar doing his PhD, and he was researching uh, the, the kind of informal credit organizations in Ethiopia. And you mentioned microcredit. Did you see any evidence of, of uh, those those informal credit credit yeah coming into play into your work yeah there are some i think one of the ones that we saw that worked very well was with the international organization unicef working with the women and so what we're looking now for is to find um microcredit systems that we can work on. that's probably one of the hardest thing though for people to get credit when you don't own the land and you don't have the house and so forth. But that's something that we're looking to build in. There is some, not as much as, as it should be though. Carol, thank you so much. Uh, just a little plug for credit unions. Um, the Cooperative Development Foundation does a lot of work with developing credit unions in, in the global south as well. So uh, it might be a model Lovely. to explore. Yeah, so thank, thank you so you. much, Carol. What a wonderful presentation, so interesting. I could talk to you all day about this. Um, uh, again, gratitudes for your talk and uh, from the Ian McPherson lecture. Uh, thank you again. Thank you.